right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Minnesota WIC Participant Centered Webinar Series. My name is Karen, and I will be facilitating the webinar today. The continued goal of these webinars is to share ideas and best practices around participant centered WIC services. Joining me today is my colleague, Allison, and she'll be doing the behind the scenes work of monitoring the phone lines and making sure that things run smoothly today. The topic area for today will be staff development and training. Creating a culture of growth and continued improvement is an important part of being a participant-centered WIC agency. So today we want to share ideas for staff development and share resources for staff development as well. As we've done with previous webinars, we sent out a pre-survey to collect ideas and tips, and we'll share those today. Here are a few key concepts about staff development that I want to make sure we touch on today. The first is that embracing PCS takes ongoing training and support. It's not easy to change styles. It's easier to slip back into telling and slip out of evoking. Someone on the survey said staff development is about covering topics more than once from different angles using different activities. The next thing is that it takes an investment, but that it's worth it. On one hand, there's benefits for participants. Every day that I have this job, every focus group that I do with participants solidifies the fact that participants don't want to feel as if they're being told what to do or to be corrected or to be made to feel like they're somehow not doing a good job. And that's never the intention of WIC staff but it's an all too common side effect of a non-PCS style of counseling. A participant-centered style of counseling works, and finding out where participants' interests and motivations are work, asking for their ideas, and sharing information that they want and need. The more people value the nutrition conversations they have at WIC, the more they stay in the program and benefit from our services. Another dividend of staff development comes from the culture it creates within the agency. I can always tell when I go into an agency that has a positive environment that is about continual learning and growth and improving. We all want to grow and be the best we can be, and staff development fulfills that need for people, leading to more satisfaction, less retention and turnover issues, more teamwork, and positive interactions and support among the staff. The third message is that resources for staff development exist. You don't have to come up with everything on your own, and we'll look at some of those today. Next is our assignment if you choose to accept it. This came from a suggestion after the last webinar. As you go through today, think about sharing one thing within that chat box on the right or you could share verbally over the phone. Think about something you currently do for staff development that you'd like to share, or pick one thing we covered today that you could see using within your site and why that might work for you, or maybe one story. Did you see any results from staff development? Did you get any feedback from participants? I will have a place at the end for sharing, either on the phone or in the chat box, but feel free to just share anything at any time during the session in that chat box. Staff development and training can take many forms. People learn in different ways. So some types of staff development could include one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions. This is when you directly observe someone and then have a short mentoring discussion after. PCS activities or exercises. These are often done at staff meetings or during staff development time. This could involve group work, individual online learning. It could take a lot of different forms. Facilitated discussions about PCS topics, concepts, role plays or scripts, allowing staff to practice new skills in a safe environment. Weekly or monthly email tips, some people mentioned these on the survey. Some staff read books together or articles, or maybe it involves just getting the resources so interested staff can read them if that's how they like to learn and grow. 
video clips, video tapes with discussion. This is a great way to stimulate thought and conversation around PCS topics. Sharing trends or best practices from mentoring. Maybe you see a trend that you want to discuss in a general way. Or maybe you saw someone use a skill or way of phrasing something that worked particularly well. With their permission, you could share that with others in the group or ask them to share it. And this would help the entire group. So staff development can be done a lot of different ways. Before we move to other examples of staff development, I do want to first touch on one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions. When we asked on the pre-survey, how do you help staff who are at different places in their skill development continue to progress, the most frequently reported answer was one-on-one -on -one mentoring. So with individualized mentoring, you can help that new staff member grow, and you can help that seasoned person who has great skills already continue to self-analyze, to focus, and improve. What mentoring sessions do is allow people to verbally process the session and their effectiveness, to voice their goals and explore options. Mentoring is about allowing that brief window of time to self-analyze. Where am I? Where do I want to be? What's working? What isn't? Mentoring allows the mentee to focus effort and attention. Most of the time we're rushing from appointment to appointment. We don't get that few minutes to think about areas where we want to focus on or give effort to. Mentoring allows for two people to share ideas with each other in a positive, supportive partnership. It helps build confidence, which helps people take risks and gives people that confidence to stay outside that comfort zone when practicing and learning. One-on-one -on -one mentoring also allows the mentor to identify common challenges or areas where many of the staff might need more training. I know that many of you are currently practicing one-on-one -on -one mentoring in your agencies. So I want to get a feel for the status of one-on-one -on -one mentoring within your agency with a poll question. So the question I'm going to ask you is, does your agency practice one-on-one -on -one mentoring? And I'll read you the different options and then we can vote. So, Option one, yes, we have a fairly regularly routine established. Yes, but not as frequently as we'd like. No, we have not initiated it yet, but we plan to. No, we don't have staff members that are comfortable with mentoring. No, due to time constraints or other challenges. Or no, individual mentoring will not work for us or other. So go ahead and vote now. Vote to coming in, but I will broadcast the results so we can see. It looks like the most popular answer is yes, but not as frequently as we'd like. And that is very common. You set a goal with one-on-one -on -one mentoring, and often life intercedes. And with a WIC clinic, we know that things come up often that can derail our schedule. But having those goals and setting those intentions do help us achieve more than we would without those goals. So I think that's great that a lot of us are doing it, even if it's not frequently as we would like. For those of you that are, are having challenges due to time or other things, one suggestion might be to just schedule one event, one mentoring session with one person. Then after that, maybe you schedule a next one. Sometimes just doing one creates a momentum, and it leads you to do more than you would have done. Another suggestion could be to find a time within your site that's the least busy. For many sites I visit, early morning is usually a good time, that first appointment of the morning. For other agencies, it could be a, a different time. So experimenting with different times during the agency to at least get your foot in the door with one-on-one -on -one mentoring. I will move on. Here are some responses from the survey around customizing the mentoring experience. Set realistic goals, such as op open-ended questions for the beginner, and make goal per staff individual when needed. So different staff may need different things from you. Beginners might need guidance and support, where seasoned employee might just need that space to help facilitate their own self-exploration. 
discuss what they want to concentrate on and strategize. Both these quotes speak to the importance of setting goals or having a focus. Just like with participants, goals help us direct our efforts and grow more quickly. We can't work on everything at once. And this quote says, discuss what they want to concentrate on. And that's so important. Where is their energy? When we are mentored, we first identify an area we want to work on. Using a personal evaluation tool for PCS skills helps us see our progress and growth areas. What a great idea, having people do a personal evaluation tool for PCS skills. They can see where their strengths are to build on and challenges as well. I focus on their talents. I am very specific about the skills that they have developed and encourage them to think about why they think they are good at those and how they could transfer to other areas. So using affirmations and pointing out someone's talents and strengths will help them develop those further and build on them. Now we'll discuss those other areas of staff development. What I'll do is after the webinars this week, I'm going to put together a packet of activities and facilitated discussions, role plays, and scripts that I've collected over the years. And I'll send this out to you with the post survey. So for those of you that are interested in looking through it, you can and see if any would help with your staff. Here are some ideas from the survey around staff development. We have been using Molly Kellogg's website for tips during our meetings, role playing. We have done some of the modules provided from other states using PCS. These are located on our WIC website. Role playing. We have a mock PCS situation and discussion at our staff meetings. We have had skill building sessions every six weeks or so where we address many different PCS topics and use a variety of activities to develop skills. Choosing one PCS topic a month to concentrate on and sharing in a large group the effectiveness or non-effectiveness of a particular skill. So what great ideas for staff development. How do you decide about topics for staff development? Well, one thing you can do is ask staff. Collect their input. Maybe you could do a bi-yearly survey with a list of topics and have them choose their favorites. That's how we determined the 12 webinars to do for the PCS series this year. We took a poll of topics and we sent out a survey we allowed each person to choose, I think it was up to five topics. And then within each group, we just took the topics with the most votes. It was a pretty simple process. Or you could use a suggestion box. Or maybe it's a brainstorming discussion with staff to get out all those possible topics of interest. Then maybe you could have a voting session with stickers or have people choose their top favorites out of the group. If staff have input into the decision process, they'll more likely be engaged during the sessions. PCS staff development can encompass many areas. Staff development could be about counseling, customer service, nutrition, or other topics. Anything that will help people grow and learn and get better at what they do. Another way to find topics for staff development is to look at trends from one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Do several people have challenges framing goal setting questions? Do several people need help when it comes to interpreting and explaining the growth grids in a way that makes sense to participants? So you can look for those trends and develop staff development ideas around that. I want to give you some resources to Find staff development and training ideas. You don't have to recreate the wheel. I like this illustration. This one person is trying to offer the wheel, and the two others say, no thanks, we're too busy. So I bet many of you can relate to that. These are just a few resources that I'll go through quickly. What I find is often one resource will lead me to another resource and another resource. One is WickWorks. There's a lot more resources for staff development on WickWorks than there used to be. So if you haven't been on WickWorks for a while, 
it might be worth the time to go and look around there. One thing they are doing is the PCS webinar series, I think it's called Bridging the Gap, where states are sharing their PCS journey and resources. These may be applicable more for a manager, or supervisor, or a mentor to listen to, not directly used for staff development, but I think you might get ideas from them to use with your staff. There's also a new online training that would be valuable for new staff. It's called VENA, Connecting the Dots Between Assessment and Intervention. And also to find staff development options, you can put in the topic participant-centered services or use this address, and several come up. Another resource available to you are the Molly Kellogg resources and the MP3 tapes. Many of you reported using these with your group. You can listen to a section separately or together and then talk about it. The link and the instructions about how to access the Molly Kellogg resources can be found on your SharePoint site. Here's a resource that's helped me for many of my activities. On this website is the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers, called MINT, their training handbook. And PCS takes many of its principles, its skills, and strategies from motivational interviewing. So some of these activities do take some adapting. I usually take the activity and then think, how can I create WIC examples instead of generic healthcare examples? Some other state resources. Many states have staff development resources on their websites. Here are just a few. The Nevada WIC CARES website. At the bottom of this website are training resources for WIC mentors. There's a collection of 11 modules that cover a variety of counseling topics with exercises and facilitated discussions for staff. The following web page from the Oregon WIC program contains many resources and training materials to help staff adopt participant-centered services. The Washington WIC Connects webpage from the Washington WIC program, it contains several short 20 to 30 minute activities for staff, along with additional resources to help staff members build their PCS skills. Video and audio recordings. The Mid-Atlantic region of WIC developed a DVD product that's a collection of 16 short staff training modules. And each training focuses on a different topic and can be completed in about 30 to 40 minutes. You can order a copy of the DVD from the WICWorks website at this address. These are my new favorites, the Behavioral Science Guys. And I love these short video clips that they have. These are two behavioral scientists who show how behavioral principles work and how we can use them to our advantage when we're trying to help people adopt positive behaviors. So you could play one at a staff meeting and then help guide a discussion. I do this for my trainings, and it works very well. Brene Brown, many of you have heard of her. She's a well-known researcher around shame and courage and on this website I listed, there's a short video on empathy that is perfectly suited for a staff meeting discussion. I love it, and I use it all the time now for WIC training. Your own state worked with two other states to create the Midwest Participant-Centered Training Video. It has 11 sections covering various aspects of WIC. Each section is about four to eight minutes long. There's a workbook with discussion questions that goes along with it. And you could watch a section and then use the questions or modify them to lead a group discussion. You can order the DVD from your WIC materials order form for your state. And you can get the workbook from this address that I listed here. Now I want to give you some examples of staff development ideas just to give you a taste. Perhaps some ideas would work for you and your staff. One person on the survey wrote, an activity that was more effective than I expected was having staff read a counseling session script out loud, and then we discussed it as a group. This has been a great way to demonstrate good counseling skills. And I will send you a few of these scripts in my packet, but I first discovered them on the Oregon WIC Listens page. They had developed scripts on how appointments might sound 
using PCS skills. And staff can act out the session using the script, and then the whole group can discuss it. I think there were four on the Oregon page, but that led me to start developing my own, which is something you can think about as well, too. I'll read you a section of one of these, but first I want to give you a couple reasons why I like them. One is that it's a little safer than a role play. It's a script, so staff are just reading the parts. So it's very safe in terms of adult learning. Also, you could incorporate different skills so staff can hear them. You can focus the questions on a particular skill or issue. For example, you could tell staff to note any reflective listening that they hear and write it down while they're listening. Or you can tell staff to listen for any resistance and see how the counselor deals with it wherever you want to focus the script. If you do decide that this is something you might want to try with staff, I would advise you to look through the scripts first and modify, if necessary, to match your state procedures. You could also assign this to whoever will be acting it out. You could give them the job of looking through it and make any, any modifications they want to. So I just cut and pasted a middle section of one of these that I'm going to read you just to give you a small taste of it. So the CPA says, so tell me, how are you feeling with this pregnancy? I was really sick at the beginning, nauseous all the time. I didn't throw up, but I had that feeling, you know. But all that went away, and now I've been feeling pretty good, hungry all the time. Your appetite is back in full swing. How would you describe your eating habits? Just okay, I guess. Tell me more about how you describe just okay. I've never really been concerned with what I eat. I mean, I do eat, but usually not a ton, just a little here and there. And most of the time I'm running around, so I eat lots of fast food or something quick. I know I should change and eat better for the baby, better stuff and more food. But with working and other stuff, I don't have the time for those sit-down meals every day. You'd like to eat a little healthier for the baby, and you want to do it in a way that works for your busy schedule. I have a handout on healthier choices you can make at fast food places. Would that be helpful for you? Definitely. Okay, I'll write down fast food on my pad here so we can make sure to come back to that after we finish a couple more questions. Okay. So this goes on, and this is just a section of it, but I wanted to give you an example. This particular script was about focusing on coordinating assessment and education, so holding education. And each script is about three to five pages long, and it just takes a few minutes to act out. So it's an option for you for a quick activity at a staff meeting. Several of you said you use role plays to help staff develop skills. This is so effective for helping people learn and practice skills but it's usually not everyone's favorite thing to do. So here are some tips for role play. Make it topic-based, so focusing on a particular skill like reflecting or a topic like breastfeeding. Or you could ask for real examples of challenging situations and then role play those. Having a discussion about the skill or about the situation first will help people focus their role play. Working with partners is safer than having, say, two people up in front of the, a whole group. If you have people willing to do that and put themselves out there like that, that's super. But often, working with partners is a very safe way to work. You can give some guidelines for characters to help build them. For example, when I do role plays around sharing information, first I pick a topic like breastfeeding. And then I have the group brainstorm common challenges they hear from participants around breastfeeding. And then I ask each partner group to pick one of these challenges to role play. You might want for the group to come up with some ground rules or things that can lighten the role plays or make them safer. Maybe each person can get a rewind or a do-over if they want to go back and try a different skill or a tactic if they want. And if someone else has other suggestions about how to make role playing successful, I encourage you to add it into the chat box as well. Here are some more ideas around staff development from the survey. 
We review at staff meetings possible role play with each other utilizing tools provided at PCS training. Weekly email tips. We have a PCS topic at our monthly staff meetings so we can discuss what is going well or challenges being experienced and brush up on techniques. Continued refresher seminars with lots of examples and practice sessions on those skills. Have a focus skill of the month everyone is working on together to use this one skill of focus. Keep it alive by talking about it. For example, situations where it worked well or where it could have gone better, informally as well as scheduled meetings. Next, I want to give a couple of examples of activities or exercises at staff meetings. Short activities are a great way to reinforce the skills learned at training. Larger training or full day trainings, they're great. They're very valuable for staff. But by necessity, they cover a lot, usually. It's often overwhelming. So the amount of retention of individual skills will vary among staff members. That's why continued ongoing practice is needing to, needed to solidify the skills. Activities could be short, 10 minutes. They could be longer, say 30 to 40 minutes, depending on the time you have available. Exercises create a learning culture, too. They give staff that shared experience of working and learning together. This is an example of a short activity from the packet I will send you. So you could give people a sheet with four participant statements on it. And somewhere in the statement is change talk. You could ask people to work in pairs or small groups, or maybe you wanted to do it all together as a group if there's only a few people at your agency. So first, what they do is read the statement and underline the change talk. And then they would come up with one or two reflections they could offer this person. So for example, the statement is, she loves the juice. She could drink it all day long. I worry a little that it's filling her up and that's why she's so picky, but at least she's getting the vitamins from the juice. So they might underline, I worry a little that it's filling her up. That's the unhappiness with the current situation. It's the talk that indicates possible willingness or movement towards change. And then they could create a reflection. Maybe it's something like, for you, some juice is okay for the vitamins, but not too much because it could impact her appetite for the other healthy food she needs. So exercises like this for app could be used with affirmations or other skills or open-ended questions. They can be quick and short. Here's another one. This is an exercise where staff practice three skills, questioning, listening, and sharing. So for this exercise, you could work in teams of four and it's often called a round robin. So the first person plays the part of the participant, and they'll read the statement. For example, they might say, I'm not going to join a gym, but I do want to exercise more. Maybe I could exercise while the kids are at their grandmother's. So then the next person in the circle would ask a question. So any question they'd like, maybe, if you were going to exercise more, what types of exercise would work for you, do you think? And then the, the participant responds naturally, whatever comes to their mind. Maybe they say something like, I don't know, I was thinking about maybe walking, that's easy, and I could listen to my music while I do it. And then the next person in the circle offers a reflection. Maybe something like, so for you, making exercise enjoyable is important and it will help you stick to it. So they're taking a guess, reflecting. Then whoever is playing the participant responds naturally again, whatever comes to their mind. Maybe they say something like, yeah, when I hate exercise, I always stop doing it. It becomes something I just dread. And then the next person in the circle shares some information. Maybe they say, statistically, people who do exercise they enjoy are more likely to stick with it. And also I've learned that when people set realistic goals, like I'll walk this many times a week for this many minutes, they're more likely to actually do it. So if you had enough staff, you could also add a summary step to this. 
where the last person has to then tie everything together and offer a summary. And then you rotate, and the next person rolls switch, and the next person will read a participant statement. This is a fun exercise. I've used it often, and it usually works great. Here are some more ideas from the survey around staff development and training. Do PCS exercise or review during monthly staff meetings, and do reflective practice as a group of three CPAs once a month to brainstorm ideas that we struggle with when using PCS skills with participants. We have started having meetings with our mentees to review each part of PCS, and then also another meeting to do activities, role play scenarios. Some have been from the mentoring webinars. So we're doing our one-on-ones quarterly now versus every month, and then having a group meeting the other two months. So it sounds like this program has modified their system over time. And this is great. It's about continually tweaking the system to find out what works for you. Don't give up on the system, but modify the system. A temperament test so each one understands herself better and understands how others are and others think and respond the same or differently. So I'm intrigued by this one. I wanted to learn more. My team actually did a personality type test one time. It was called Colors Training. And it did bring us closer together. And I think we learned about each other, and it helped us work more closely together. So if you did something similar, you can feel free to share in the chat box. Facilitated discussions are a great way to help staff explore and grow within a topic. Discussions can be formal or informal. They can be topic-based or not. They can be short or long, depending on the time you have available. They help people keep PCS in the discussion and help them continue to verbally explore a topic. They continue to put the focus on growth. And the essential ingredient of a facilitated discussion is questions. Open questions to get people talking. Good questions for a facilitated discussion are not knowledge-based questions where there's a right answer. If there's one right answer, then that information is best given in a straightforward way. Better questions for a facilitated discussion are about people's experience with PCS. How do they take core concepts around PCS, nutrition, and health, and then turn those into action with participants? I'll give you a few examples of facilitated discussions in that packet that I'll send out. But it's pretty easy to create your own as well on any topic. First, I think about the topic. Say it's affirmations. Then I sit down and I brainstorm some open-ended questions that would help facilitate a conversation around affirmations. I'll give you some examples. Maybe you have other ones. Think about a time when you received a deeply meaningful compliment from someone you trusted and respected. How did it feel? What made the compliment meaningful? So have them think about that and answer that. What are some reasons we use affirmations in our counseling at WIC? What happens when people feel good about themselves and confident? What are some strengths that we see in our participants? How can we affirm those strengths? What are some ways that we can affirm each other? So after each of these, I could be asking several questions. I could be asking for examples, who feels the same, who feels differently. Can someone offer me an example of that? Things to keep that conversation going. You could even give homework. After the, after the discussion, you could ask people to practice affirmations and note how participants respond. And then at the next staff meeting, you could ask them to bring back examples of affirmations they tried and how they worked. Here's another fun idea. One month, you could have a journal club. You could buy small notebooks. They have the kind in Target that are about a dollar each. And then for one month, you could ask people to journal, maybe a few times during the day, when something goes right, when something goes wrong, when they have a success or a challenge, when they have an aha moment about counseling or customer service, depending on their role. And then have a staff meeting and ask them 
to be prepared to share some of those insights. They could share their biggest aha moments. They could share things that worked, successes. You could ask for all their challenges, get them all out, and then look for themes, and then brainstorm those with the bigger group. So just another idea for, around staff development. We asked you on the survey about tips for leading staff development activities. And I want to share some strategies with you. Like a conductor for an orchestra, as a facilitator, people look to you for their clues on how to be. They look to you for comfort and engagement. You set the tone. The group will read your energy and respond accordingly. You create an atmosphere of acceptance and support. You encourage participation. Here are some ideas from the survey around tips for leading groups. Come prepared. Ask for input, involve all staff, quick, interesting. Have staff involvement. Keeping the group on task. Staying confident when you aren't sure if, st if a staff activity will work. The discussions often turn out better than expected. Using open-ended questions and other PCS skills to help staff e explore their opinions, experiences, and questions around PCS. Listening to mentees. Having a goal in mind to concentrate on a particular focus. So listening is probably the most important skill when facilitating groups. As a facilitator, you're introducing the topic. It's important to give clear directions. One thing I've started doing is after the directions for an activity, I ask, what questions do people have about this activity? This is a safe way to ask. It gets questions out early. And often, I think I was clear when I was given the directions, and then I realized that a big portion of the audience didn't understand the activity. So it's important to ask. Another tip to facilitation is to engage the audience in the discussion. People learn better when they're involved. Also, getting people talking early on, it helps people. They say it helps them hear their voice in the room. People who speak early are more likely to contribute throughout the discussion. This is an important piece for me, making it safe. So adult learners, we don't want to appear foolish when we're learning. And we said that learning and incorporating PCS skills is challenging. So we want to make it as safe as possible for people to try, to take a leap, to try something new. And that's the way we grow and learn. So a couple of tips for making it safe. One is to have small group discussion or partner share before going to the larger group. We use this in training a lot. This helps shy people contribute who might not feel comfortable in the bigger group. They're more comfortable in a smaller group. It also helps people test out their thoughts or ideas with that smaller audience. Then they get feedback and confidence to bring that idea to the bigger group. One safe way to collect input or ideas is brainstorming. In brainstorming, we tell the group to throw out any and all ideas. There's no judging. There's no, that won't work because just all ideas, no matter how wacky. And then once you have all the ideas, then the next step can be focusing on ideas that are feasible or ideas that have the most support. But with brainstorming, you often get a bigger breadth of ideas. And often, you get that idea you might not have thought of without that kind of free, unmonitored process. Whenever possible, you don't want to tell people they're wrong outright. You can use gentler ways. You can thank them for sharing. You can say things like, that's a good example of advice giving. And with a small tweak, we could turn that into an open-ended question. So skills on how to be gentle, can, you can develop over time. In staff development and training, if there's only one right answer, then don't ask a question. This sets people up to be wrong, which isn't safe. And, and same with participants. If there's only one right answer, just tell them the information instead of asking for it. Just some tips to make the conversations as safe as possible. So I want to do a poll question about how you would respond if someone gave an incorrect answer. Maybe you were doing the reflection question or exercise listed above. And the statement was, she loves the juice. She could drink it all day long. I worry a little that it's filling her up, and that's why she's so picky. But at least she's getting the vitamins from the juice. And so you ask people to come up with reflections 
And maybe one person comes back with this statement. You could water it down so she gets the taste of juice without so much. Now, how would you respond in a gentle way to correct this person? Because that's not a reflection, that's more advice giving. So I'm going to give you a few options, and maybe you have a better one. So how would you respond to that? What I'll do is I'll read each one because they're long, and then you can pick a favorite and we'll vote. So the first response is, that's a good suggestion we could give her. Sometimes doing a reflection of her motivation first can often lead them to ask a question to ask you for advice, which is great. Like, you want her to have some juice, but not too much. She might say, yeah, how do I do that? Or, reflections are a little tricky. You're not necessarily responding to her question with direct advice, but you're giving her a statement that lets her know you're listening and you hear her motivations. Like you could say, juice makes her happy and has vitamins, so you want her to have some, but you don't want her to fill up on it and not get, that, get those other nutritious things from food. Or another one could be, that's a good suggestion for her. Sometimes giving advice is the best thing. Sometimes asking a question is appropriate. And sometimes using a reflection where you're using a statement to reflect her feelings is the way to go. For each situation, there are a lot of different ways to approach it. And you get to decide what to use for each situation. Or maybe there's another statement that you want to use. So go ahead, let's vote now. What statement would you use? As they're coming in, I'll broadcast these so we can see where the votes are coming in. And it looks like a pretty even split, but it looks like the top response is, uh, has the most votes. So that's one I use often where I say, that's a good example of X whatever it is. That's a good suggestion we could give her. And then try to be gentle in that correction of how can we take that and then make it a reflection. Another technique with training and especially with facilitated discussions, another good technique is called throwing it back. If someone asks you a question, you can throw it back to the group and ask who has an opinion about this or who has a suggestion. Again, if there's only one right answer, say they ask you a procedural question, then you don't throw it back, you would just answer it. But if the question is, how would you deal with this situation? Or what suggestions do you have for this situation? Then throw it back to the group and see what answers they come up with. It's often a little tough because you might have a good answer in your mind, but I always tell myself that I can share my ideas at the end if I want to. And what I often find is that the group comes up with such good, varied ideas that I don't need to share mine. They're often better than my response would have been. So this practice of throwing it back creates cross-discussion and more options for the asker of the question. And there might be differences of opinion in the group. And you can just welcome that and stress that there are very few firm rules when it comes to participants and services. And we each have to find our own style that works for us. With staff development training, I would add, don't worry about sharing too much. With bigger trainings, we almost have to overwhelm them because it's hard to focus on just one area or topic or skill. But at the local level, it is possible. Most agencies are likely to have a staff meeting every month or every other month where it's possible to just focus on a small piece of information. With PCS2, it's the, often the core concept that it's important most of the time. The emotion, the approach is the important thing. Most often it's not a lot about a lot of facts. So you want to think about stickies. I like to think, what's going to stick with them that they can take back with their WIC sessions? So you're trying to start, spark a motivation to continue to practice and grow. Someone in the survey talked about the importance of having management support for staff development, and that is absolutely true. It's so important. We said that staff development is an investment. There's a price, the price of time and energy. And one thing we can do is help management see the potential of that investment. Maybe as a mentor, you work hand-in-hand -hand with agency management on staff development. Maybe, depending on the size of your agency, maybe the job falls more to you. 
some tips for eliciting support from agency management. We can sell the benefits of staff development. We can come prepared with ideas. This is my plan. I would like to have 15 to 20 minutes every staff meeting for an activity or a discussion. And I'd like to do X number of mentoring sessions each month. You could emphasize how you'll keep the impact as small as possible while still being effective. Maybe share how you're going to focus mentoring sessions early in the morning to have the least impact on the schedule. You can discuss the payoff of the investment. What does it mean for Wix bottom line? Better skilled staff, happy, more engaged participants, higher caseloads, more engaged staff. One resource I'd like to point out to you is the new Mentor Training Handbook. And these materials are on the SharePoint site. This is designed for new mentors and takes them through a 10-step process to learn to become a WIC mentor. If the time comes to add new mentors to your program, you could use this tool. So I'd like to stop now and offer people the chance to put an idea in the chat box and write something that you heard today that you might want to try or something that you've tried in your agency that's worked. Maybe one suggestion for people or one story. And I will allow a couple seconds of silence if people want to come off mute and share. So I'll do that now. If anyone would like to come off mute and share, they can do that as well. OK, well, we will leave the chat box up. If people do want to type in their ideas into the box, go ahead and do that. We'll leave it up for about five minutes after we close today. But while we're doing that, I would like to just tell you about that packet of materials that I'm sending. I'll send out a bunch of ideas and activities that I've tried. Some of you might have experienced them at, at some of our trainings. Some might be adapted to your state policies or phrasing. And you can feel free to use these or not use these. It's really up to you. It's just another resource for staff development. And I would say by next week, you should receive these along with a post survey for the webinar. OK, and some people are typing in the chat box, so feel free to continue to do that. And so I want to thank you for your continued level of participation in these webinars. And I hope you join us again for the future more in these webinars. And I would invite you to, when we do send out a pre-survey for each webinar, if you could take the time to help us with those questions, it adds to each webinar. So I want to say thank you and goodbye. <laughs>